welcome everyone to Inside the Hive, a bot hive podcast where we take a deep dive into all things robotics. We have a very special two part podcast on the world of 5G and robotics. So, from the bot hive team, as always, I'm Yaz Hagigat, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by the bot hive strategic advisor, Paul Hyde. Paul, welcome. Thank you, Yaz. On today's podcast, Paul and I are going to be speaking to three experts from the University of Glasgow who are international leaders in research and development on wireless communication systems and their applications. I'd like to introduce Dr. Gudong Zhao, who is a lecturer at the university's James Watt School of Engineering, where his research is mainly based in communication and co-design, specifically in the field of robotics. Dr. Hadi Haydari is a senior lecturer at the University School of Engineering, whose research focuses on microelectronics design for different ranges of applications, including healthcare technology and IoT, the Internet of Things. Finally, also joining us today is Professor Mohammed Imran. Professor Imran is the Professor of Communication at Glasgow School of Engineering and is also Dean of Glasgow's UESTC collaboration where he leads a research group on communication sensing and imaging, where research focuses on wireless communication systems and the vertical industries that are enabled by wireless communication. So welcome, everyone. It's great to have you with us today. Those are some amazing credentials that I just reeled off. So to all of our listeners who are new to the world of robotics and automation, I'd like to say in short... Our three guests are international experts in 5G and robots, doing the research into how this new era of digitalization will help you improve your business productivity and future-proof your business. So I'd just like to dive straight into it. And Paul, I'm sure you'll have follow-up questions too. Professor Imran, can you just give it to us in simple terms? What does the introduction of 5G and automation technology actually mean for UK business? Indeed, yes. 5G is, in my opinion, a transformative technology. Uh, That's why it is in the hype and everyone is talking about it. And the reason why it is transformative is it's not an incremental improvement on 4G or 3G or previous generations of wireless connectivity. Rather, it really revolutionizes how things are done in terms of digital connectivity and how things are automated. So in terms of developing the wireless communication infrastructure, running the wireless system, the 5G technology first time brings in full automation of configuration, optimization, and then even diagnosis and healing of the digital part or the connectivity part of the system as well. Now, combining this with the robotics technology, the automation can go one step further. You can imagine uh, how 5G can enable driverless cars, Uh, enable people working from remote locations and is still being able to do skilled jobs, the jobs that can only be delivered by someone's hands and someone's experience as a human experience. Of course, robotics is already in uh, well-established technology in terms of uh, uh, automation of, for example, uh, car industry, aeroplane industry, where components are being put together by pre-programmed robots. But what 5G enables is live control by a human operator from a remote location for any robotic operation. 5G will enable this by actually transforming the digital connectivity technology on three important aspects. One is higher data throughputs, so it can transmit data at a much faster speed, and reducing the latency. This is very important because as an end user, sometimes we don't realize how important this latency is. But 5G technology can reduce that latency and allow for tactile feedback of any controlling human operator. So when he moves something, he can feel how it is moving. The feedback is coming back to the operator. And the final important bit that 5G will enable is massive connectivity, especially for machine type devices. And this massive connectivity means that at the same time, a lot of devices will be connected, large and small, with diverse applications. So that's the very brief summary of why 5G is transformative and how, what it can enable for many businesses. Yeah, thanks, Professor. Yeah, I think that's that's a really, really interesting point there. And, and certainly I think the latency issue is a, is a, is a game changer, isn't it, versus previous uh, wireless technologies. In, in terms of where we are in, in rollouts, uh, I mean, is this still a, 
something to be developed or, or, is, or is the technology actually in the marketplace now? Is, is the five, are the 5G networks there or are they coming that's going to enable this in the, in the near term? Indeed, a very good question because just like any other previous technology in wireless connectivity, 5G will be deployed in a phased stage, uh, keeping the backward compatibility as well. So currently, the technology that we are already seeing in the market is non-standalone 5G technology, which means that gradually we are replacing the radios with 5G radios and is still relying on a lot of backhaul as well as a lot of core functionality, which, which is still 4G or 4.9G grade. So this will definitely improve the throughput as well as number of devices to be connected and to some extent the latency as well. But full benefits of 5G will be realized by standalone 5G deployment, which is an end-to-end new generation of wireless connectivity and for standalone we have to wait for early new year there are some standalone deployments already in place but they will be more widely rampant in new year 2021 that's the time when we will actually experience very low latency communication as well however that said there are test beds and there are other trial networks which are already operating in very low latency uh, regime. The reason for that is the spectrum is dedicated for them as well, and the load or congestion is not very high. So you can trial the low latency use cases as an application on those test networks. And and in in your your knowledge of of this sector, are you seeing some specific use cases now that are are out there in the market? And, And based on those use cases, What's the real benefit those users are seeing versus the original ways they were applying solutions? Is there any examples that you can give our listeners? Yes, indeed. In terms of demonstration of uh, capability of the technology, nearly all of the visionary use cases that were talked about five, six years have been shown in some form or shape by different either research teams or development teams across the globe. For example, people have talked about remote surgery. So people have demonstrated that that can be done with extreme control and tactile feedback, looking at controlling the robots for uh, setting up circuits in a remote location. Even our group has demonstrated that that can be done even across UK and China. So you can enable students to control a robotic arm to set up electronic circuits on a breadboard. So these kind of use cases have been already demonstrated, of course, using trial and test networks. The challenge now here is how to scale them up at a global scale and let the people benefit from them just like they are benefiting from other use cases using 4G and other technologies. But this year obviously has been an exceptional year due to the various and, and wide challenges of the, of the pandemic. And, and you've talked already about uh, medical applications, Professor, and, and how in particular 5G latency can, can help with that and link, link to robotics. I mean, do you, do you see the... Has the landscape changed as a result of the, the pandemic through 5G and robotics? Is it, is it accelerating the development of, of solutions? Is it accelerating the adoption of these technologies? What, what's your view on, on how the world's changed this sector this year? Yes, I think this is, this is one of the uh, bright side that we can look at from all the difficulties that we have gone through this pandemic. One of the bright side is that it has really accelerated the uh, ad- advancement of digital technology, digital connectivity. The reason for that is people have now realized that how important connectivity is for not only doing and continuing the work, but keeping the economies of the big com- com- countries running. Now, uh, there are two aspects of what pandemic has done in terms of 5G. One aspect is 5G has come or 4G even has come to rescue uh, a lot of uh, operations and businesses, people working from home, many times their broadband when it is not working and not reliable, especially Wi-Fi works on non licensed ex- spectrum and is not as reliable as, uh, say, 4G or 5G technology. People fall back to uh, their mobile network connectivity and use uh, their local Wi-Fi, their local uh, mobile based access points for digital connectivity while working from home. And it has also enabled Uh, use cases like we have worked on a use case where we have developed a clinic on the wheels where a mobile mobile connected van can go to care homes and rural areas to the doorstep of people who need medical assistance and this is not just covid related it's not covid testing that they need because of the hospitals being overloaded many people can 
now cannot easily come to the hospitals for having their regular checkups. So taking the medical care to their doorstep not only relieves pressures from the hospitals, but it also allows those people to get the health care in a much easier manner. So imagine people who are in care homes, sometimes they're not as mobile as we are uh, and not as able as we are to go and wait in hospital for several hours. Now, how robotics fits into this is when that uh, mobile van actually goes to a care home or any other location dispensing their medical help, uh, the access to an experienced nursing staff or even a medical staff can sometimes be very, very useful to dispense of remote diagnostics, right, using a robotic arm, for example. So that's that's one use case application. So even after pandemic will be over, this has its use and benefit to provide good grade medical facility for rural areas, for people who are less mobile and are not easily brought to the hospital to bring the hospital or sort of a mini hospital to them in their uh, local uh, home or their care home. So that's a great use case. The other aspect that uh, pandemic has also highlighted is the need for automation within 5G networks as well. Because as you can understand that pandemic did not hit just one sector, it hit every, every sector. And even it was in many cases very difficult for uh, continuing to maintain and run the cellular infrastructure where demands suddenly changed. Because previously the city centers were uh, demanding peak data rates in daytime because offices were there. But people started working from home, the traffic dynamics changed, and there was a need to reconfigure the network. And then people realized how beneficial it would have been if we were ready with automation within 5G infrastructure as well. So that has actually driven a new drive of self-organized networking and automated wireless networks. These are real game-changing technologies in the way they can be applied. And, and in particular, you know, your reference to, to healthcare, which more than ever is is at the top of every country's consideration list on, on how they you know how they how they deliver those services and, and also as you as you correctly identified remote working where uh, nearly all of us are doing more of that at the moment and like to continue to do so i mean how quickly do you think these new technologies can be adopted are there any barriers to getting these new technologies and solutions out into the market particularly in those areas of healthcare and, and remote working the barriers are there Surprisingly, some of those barriers are not technological barriers. They are more social and security related or change in human behavior related barriers. So as a simple example, I talk about this uh, healthcare technology, for example. Even if technology is ready, latency is low, throughput is manageable, uh, number of connected devices is manageable. One big concern that people have, and it's a genuine concern, is the privacy of the data that they share. On, on these networks. Who will have access to it? How it will be utilized? How long it will be saved? And how it can be used against them, if not in their favor? All these concerns stop people from easily sharing their own data. And uh, wearable technology has already been there for several years, and it works well with 4G as well. But the uptake, especially for healthcare monitoring, for local Personal monitoring, people have adopted it, but for sharing this data with their GP, with their medical practitioners, there has been a reluctance. So that's why our group is also working on privacy preservation techniques. So uh, again, interestingly, several other wireless related security and trust mechanisms, they can be adopted to make the data for medical and healthcare facilities much more secure and private. And the user becomes an owner of that data. And data cannot be shared with anyone else without users' explicit consent and control. That will be a game changer in terms of adoption of uh, healthcare technology. And this also applies to robotics as well. So security is an important integral factor which will allow for more adoption of robotic arms. Imagine as a factory floor. If I am the owner of that factory floor and I want to use robotics to operate that factory floor, I would definitely want to be fully in control that no external person can get access to my robotic arms and can, these cannot be controlled from outside. Mobile private 5G networks are moving in the right direction to enable and provide that kind of control. So we are moving away from using public 5G infrastructure to do things like this. So you can now deploy your own private 5G network on a factory floor and then you have full control on 
the robotics and other infrastructure on your factory floor? I mean, I think you're absolutely right. There's just security questions and concerns are, are very valid and, and very high up people's lists, aren't they? As we have more movement of data and, and data which identifies individuals, the giving people the confidence that that data protected is absolutely key to getting people to accept and use these new technologies. I mean, do you, do you think those privacy mechanisms are, are keeping pace with the development of the solutions and is the regulatory landscape keeping pace? Because clearly one, one of the things is we need regulation that allows the solutions of businesses to develop these technologies to be into market, but we don't want overly onerous regulation that uh, that is a barrier to adoption. So are, are we getting that balance about right, do you think? Striking the right balance is very important. You have very rightly pointed out. So everyone is aware that data protection regulations are important for safeguarding individual data, but they should not hinder, for example, the advent of beneficial technologies which will benefit the whole society. So you have to strike the right balance. Uh, Of course, our freedom and our privacy is very important. Everyone values it as individual as well as as a society. We should value it. But at the same time, sharing that data in a protected and private privacy preserved manner uh, for the benefit of the whole society is very important as well. And there is a need for making this realization happen to people. So say, for example, there are gamers, young youngsters who play games, and they are very willing to share a lot of data with anyone, any quantity. They don't realize because they are enjoying that game and they are happy with that gaming environment. But when it comes to sharing some health data, we can really transform the future artificial intelligence or machine learning driven care. That data is significant because that data helps in that learning and adaptation of automation. But people are not very willing to share that data. So there is this discrepancy, you can say, that people are sometimes not very careful in sharing their personal data for very small financial gain. But they don't realize that sharing another side of the data, which has an extraordinary big gain, societal gain or care gain, they're not willing to share that data. So uh, that requires awareness. So you are very right. Policy combined with public awareness of what technology can do for them and what kind of data sharing is more beneficial from them in long run and in societal aspect. That is the key to overcome this barrier. Yes, I, I mean, you're right, isn't it? It's, it is interesting that how people will unwittingly share large amounts of data, but uh, when it's more visible, are very restrictive. I mean, I guess the second topic that's very much in people's minds and governments are almost scrabbling with each other now to show they're leading in this area is is environmental responsibility and, and in particular around consumption of energy you know, linked to, to CO2 emissions and challenges of reducing that. Do you see the, the application of these technologies? Is that a risk as data centres have often been cited as big users of energy or, or is it an opportunity to add and support the environmental concerns that, that many of us now have? If you compare device for device, it will be more energy efficient. Because as the technology is improving, the amplifiers, as well as radio access units, antenna design, the physical layer hardware, all of that is becoming more efficient in terms of their energy consumption and uh, the amount of a percentage of energy that they waste. But the scale is increasing. So there will be many more devices which will be in operation. And that's why maybe the carbon footprint of the 5G network deployment might be slightly larger or maybe significantly larger than 4G. But... At the same time, it, it it provides us an opportunity to use it as a tool to save energy consumption in so many different sectors. We touched upon remote working. So now we are doing it because of pandemic. But in future, if we are doing it out of our choice, there will be significant saving on carbon footprint. As people have already seen, seen uh, throughout the world, because of pandemic, when people stopped traveling a lot, uh, there was significant reduction in carbon emissions. And in addition to that, you can also think of many other use cases where digital connectivity can be used to provide persuasive input to end users to transform their energy needs. For example, if uh, you are connected to a smart grid and you have a mobile handset in your hand as well, and your usage of energy at home is being monitored, it's very easy to detect inefficient use of energy. For example, You have several rooms where lights are switched on, but no one is using that light. So that could be transmitted to you as a message on your mobile phone with a persuasive statement saying that 
you can save a lot of energy, you can reduce your carbon footprint if you do X, Y, Z. So that is another way of saving energy and transforming end user perspective on energy. Finally, I would say uh, a lot of remote working can be not only energy saving in the sense of uh, avoidance of travel, but when you use technology, you can improve the accuracy and precision of how you are manufacturing specific products in a factory. So you can reduce the waste or rejections from the quality point of view. So that can improve the carbon footprint of the operation of those industrial operations. That's great. Thanks very much, Professor. And then f- final question for me, really, which I think maybe is an opportunity to, to summarize many the excellent insights and points that you've made. If Looking forward, I don't know, five, five ten years, what, what do you see for, for the way we live and work, for, for society? What could be the biggest game changers, the biggest benefits from the, the rollout and adoption of for both 5G and automation technologies? I think the biggest change would be that we will rely a lot on digital connectivity with the benefit that a lot of things will be automated for us, freeing up time for doing other things that we cherish, spending time with families, spending time with our near and dear ones, and acting as a society, helping each other. So the main game changer would be how we live our everyday lives. So a lot of automation will bring respite or relief on the pressures that people are facing in terms of doing their own personal jobs as well as doing the jobs through which they earn. Plus, it will also help us transform the way how we interact with one another. So as you can imagine that 5G and even technologies beyond beyond 5G are enabling people to be virtually present in many different places. So without actually physically traveling. So it can improve the connectivity between human to human as well. You can visit your near and dear ones without actually physically going there as well. So of course, 5G or even beyond 5G will enable that kind of communication of senses. For example, touch, smell, and vision and audio is already being communicated as we are talking, we are communicating audio. But other senses can be communicated through digital connectivity as well. And when that is possible, you can actually enable virtual or telepresence of humans in different places. That that would also be a big game changer in future. Thank you, Professor. Some really interesting insights. I'd like to touch on what you were saying about the social aspects of automation and transforming the way that 5G and robotics will change the way that we interact with each other and pick up with Dr. Haydari to speak more on social robotics and healthcare. Dr. Haydari, healthcare is obviously at the forefront of a lot of our minds considering the pandemic struggle we're all living in at the moment. From remote surgery to rehabilitation robotics, 5G is making a huge impact on the healthcare industry, and especially living in these times where social distancing has become part of our everyday lives, 5G and robotics has never been more important. Can you tell us more about the advancement of robotics in the healthcare industry, perhaps speaking more on how robots are helping in the pandemic? Robotic technologies appear in many areas that directly affect the healthcare and patient care. In fact, during this pandemic, coronavirus, period that we have. So they can be used, for example, for disinfect the patient rooms in hospital. So they can they can use the hospitals to reduce the load of the disinfecting the not only the environment, but also the clothes, masks, and other things. So that can reduce significantly the risk for patients and also the medical personnel and NHS personnel that we have. These kind of robots, for example, they generally, they can work in laboratories to take samples. Uh, They can transport, they can analyze, store them in a proper place. The first example is surgical precisions. So they can be used, the doctors or medical personnel are away from the patients. For example, in future, we have a telesurgery. The doctors from London can make a surgery in Africa. So for this Definitely, we need a very high networks that 5G in future provides this. Another area that robotic can actually affect the future uh, technologies is uh, wearable electronics. So, for example, wearable robots that can work uh, to monitor the vital signs. So that can help out the care back into healthcare. 
So for example, currently we have a uh, many variables like uh, wristbands, like a uh, head worn for monitoring the EEG, for example. There are a lot of chest worn patch that can monitor the ECG. So they can be employed as a part of the robotic technologies in future. Another area that especially for people with disability that can help. So we call it robotic assistance for a better life. Correct. So like a prosthetics. So these prosthetics can help people, especially with elderly people, people with disabilities, so they can actually get help from robots for a better life. Robots can improve significantly the quality of life for this kind of people. So this, of course, can go for the exoskeletons. So again, we can see that the robots can help for the better walk, for better moving around, for the moving or transferring the heavy loads. So that is is an additional help that robots can help humans in future. Hadi, if, what have been the main sort of drivers that have uh, resulted in robotics coming into the healthcare sector? I mean, how, how, how did this sort of technology revolution really begin? What drove these, these changes and the introduction of robotics, would you say? So I believe there are many parameters from very multidisciplinary field. So, for example, communication is the new area that can help the robots in terms of the network. In past, we had a robots only a mechanical engineer, but actually robots is not mechanical engineering only. So later they combine the electronics engineering and they said, okay, you know, mechatronics engineering, so mechanic and electronics. But again, it's not only mechanics and electronics because other science also involve. So computer engineering, AI, so no artificial intelligence is coming to control and bringing the uh, the smart robots, so that is is new. And then later, even other kind of, for example, sensors. So no sensors like ultrasounds, like touch sensors, tactile sensors. So sensors, robots need to have a, this sense of feeling. So they need to sense the food taste. So there are there are many disciplines that they all should be combined to synergize these kind of robots that can be used for the healthcare. And if you take if you take AI, if you take the development of AI, Hadi, I mean, is that is that now having a big impact in the in the performance of robots within the healthcare sector? Is that is that part of the sort of game changing of of technology development, linking AI technologies with the mechanical robotics part? Yes, indeed. Actually, that is, is a very good point. I want to give you an example. You know, robots, by gathering the information from elderly people, so imagine we have elderly people in an indoor or outdoor, and we have information from their movements. So, you know, using AI, robots can analyze the different kind of, for example, neurological disorders in the elderly people and can predict this one, something like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. So this kind of disease can be predicted in the elderly people. And this is where AI is coming for the robotics and healthcare technologies for analyzing and predicting such disease. I understand. If you look at sort of remote, either remote control or diagnostics or remote analytics, uh, I would imagine that there are other technologies such as 5G, which clearly allows a much greater and faster transfer both ways of data. I mean, how how do you see the rollout of 5G supporting this these sort of applications of robotics? Yeah, indeed, 5G provides a better environment and better substrate for the having very higher bandwidth, lower latency. So in that case, we can receive real-time signals. We can receive real-time signals. And for closed loop, for example, sometimes in case we need to have a feedback and we need to stimulate something and we need a real-time stimulations for having a closed loop healthcare actually loop. So that is something 5G can provide in terms of the not only signals, so these signals can be, for example, in some cases, video. 
So that video, you know, needs to have a not only video, so maybe can be computing. So one of the ideas that currently is uh, very uh, becoming popular is computing in the cloud, for example. So rather than robots can compute and analyze the information on the robot itself, they can compute and analyze in the cloud. So 5G is the where these computations can happen. I see, I see. And it, so, so this, this technology rollout, is, is this going to replace work that's currently done by humans? Is it going to enable the, the humans working within healthcare to, to perform better or, or get through a greater volume of, of treatment or patient care? I mean, how, how do you see, you know, if you look forward the next sort of five to 10 years, how, how do you see the application of these technologies affecting the way healthcare systems work and the people within the system work? So, of course, the having a wider networks, they can provide us much better information. For example, if we, if we provide environments, like, for example, imagine a city. A city in an urban area or even in a rural area, we have a wide 5G networks and robots can be connected through the networks. So, this robot in hospitals or even in the home for the monitoring the vital signs, so they can be connected. Doctors in the hospitals can access more actually numbers of the vital sign of the their patients in the home. This can be uh, works, for example, in the pandemic area. I am sure you heard a lot of the apps that has been developed. So these apps could send the signals to everyone that about the environment that they are more affected by uh, by virus. This can be done by by using the robots, and these robots can be send the signals using the, these networks indeed. Yeah, I mean, I guess more than, more than ever in, in the current pandemic circumstances, yeah, automation and, and artificial intelligence to, su- to support healthcare development is, is more and more critical than, than ever. And, and from your experience, are you seeing certain elements of healthcare where robotics and AI are more advanced? I mean, which areas of healthcare are are sort of leading this this revolution in this sector? In fact, part of my research is based on the implantable electronics, implantable devices that can implant it in brain to cure some disease, for example, epilepsy. I'm sure you have seen the Elon Musk Neuralink company. So this Elon Musk uh, attracted a lot of attention by implanting chip in the pig head and monitor the signs in the brain. So this is a future revolution in the uh, in the robotics. So it will be a nanorobots that can be implanted in the brain, for example, monitoring the brain activity, so curing treatment of the disease in the human body. So it's not only brain, it can be in the heart for the cardiac smart stent that we have currently, or several other parameters like ECG, blood pressure, and this is the nanorobots that can be held inside the body and connected wirelessly to a cloud which can be accessed for example to the medical doctors so this will be you know something that we can think about in future i mean it sounds like from what you're saying harry there's there's clearly many many opportunities where where this technology can support but i'm assuming there must be challenges in in its introduction and, and clearly there are those that are already embracing the, these changes and those that are perhaps more unsure about, about how it can help them. I mean, if, if you've got healthcare sectors, you've got hospitals, you've got you know, people in this sector interested in, in this technology and, and how, how it might be able to deliver benefits for them is, I mean, how, how do you approach the possibilities? How do you understand? How do you evaluate you know, how, what this technology can, can do in terms of supporting the, the solutions that you're providing? In fact, by receiving the different kind of signals that vital sign from human to hospital. So this can reduce a lot of the loads that hospitals currently are experiencing. Doctors, you know, they can monitor and they can actually visit their patients using the 5G and robots that they have remotely. And one thing that actually I should mention about the the power energy that we 
require for the millions of the sensors in future, you know, these sensors that are on the robots or, you know, can be indoor, outdoor. Imagine each robot, they need a, to consume a lot of power for computations. But if we have all computation in a single place, in a cloud, we can save a lot of power also. So that is, is a, another issue that we have to consider in future in terms of the saving power so power will be a big issue and by using the 5g we can do the all computations in cloud which will offer a low cost robots because they are they don't do any computations there but they can send the signals they can compute in the clouds with the cheap sensors and then uh, you know give a feedback and then in your in your experience Hadi, if if as a business I'm I'm trying to explore how how I understand how to integrate these technologies in, into into the healthcare sector, I mean, how do you start that process? Where do I go? I'm I'm listening to this podcast. I'm thinking I, I need to find out more about this. You know, where, where if someone was asking you how how you'd evaluate this opportunity, what what would you suggest? What's what's the best route to to understanding the possibilities? Actually, working with the partners, always with the partners in industry and also with the universities. In case of myself, I'm working in a healthcare technologies through a couple of uh, European projects. So in one of the projects, it's called Hermes. So it is a 8 million pan-European grant. And that one, we are working with 12 other partners across Europe to develop implantables that they can implant it in the brain. And uh, also I have another project that through that project, we are wirelessly sending the power to the implantables and then receiving the data. So that made them fully wireless without any battery inside the, the implant. So that is where actually I'm approaching this kind of science. So through the partners and also universities, industries that we have. Yeah, so it sounds like there's a lot of knowledge out there that, that people can, can tap into. And, and the final question from me, Hadi, really is look, look forward I don't know, five years, 10 years. And from the healthcare sector, what, what do you think is going to be the biggest changes in, in the way the healthcare sector operates as, as a result of robotics and AI? What's that, you know, if you're future gazing, what, what's going to be different and how's that going to benefit those using healthcare services? I believe in future, the most things that will happen, this 5G will provide include computing for robotics and that can be a big success for healthcare technologies. If this happens, then we will have the telesurgery, we will have a remote monitoring for elderly people, for people with disability. So this is include computing. That is the way with using the low-cost robots. So this is the way that in future will happen and will make a revolution. Well, I think, you know, more than ever this year, I think we've all, we've all seen the uh, value that the healthcare system adds to society in general, but, but equally important, we've all seen the uh, pressures that it comes under during a pandemic, and therefore, you know, everyone's now looking at the technology in, in how it can help the system run more effectively and efficiently, aren't they? I find it incredibly interesting that 5G is more than just being a fast network. As Dr. Hazeri was saying, it can also be the source of wireless charging for robotics and provide quick access to important information about patients' vital signs to doctors. Professor Imran brought up interesting points on privacy at the beginning of this episode too. He will have genuine questions on where the data goes and who sees it, and it's great to know that the professor and his team are working specifically on data protection and security of your personal information, not only in our day-to-day -day lives, but also for business owners who will be able to protect their IP. In part two of this two-part special, we dive into the electronics industry, the constructions industry, and tips on how to prepare your business for 5G. Thank you for listening to this two-part special with the University of Glasgow. This has been Inside the Hive, a robotics podcast by BotHive. If you have any thoughts on what you've heard today, you can get in contact with us by emailing team at bot-hive.com 
or on social media where all our handles are at we are bot hive we'll see you back here next time on inside the hive for part two